the first question we're going to talk about this morning is what is the filling of the Holy Spirit? What is the filling of the Holy Spirit? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, the Apostle Paul uses an illustration to make the point of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. What is the analogy? What is the illustration that he uses? Don't get drunk, right? It's not just wine, but don't, be, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living. I like reckless living better than debauchery because I think I mispronounce it half the time. Uh, so I like reckless living. I can pronounce that. But be filled with the Spirit. And so Paul compares being filled with the Spirit to being drunk. When someone is consumed with alcohol, it controls everything about them. It controls uh, or it affects their reflexes. Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, normally they have quick reflex, but all of a sudden they struggle making decisions. I mean, it's amazing uh, to watch that little driving deal where they put them glasses on you, make you feel like you're sort of drunk, and watch somebody try to drive. Uh, you know, it, it begins to impact your reflexes. It affects your mind. Your ability to make good decisions is uh, impacted. Your eyes, sometimes you'll see things that aren't really there. And so it really begins to consume all that you are. Matter of fact, if law enforcement, if they're going to do, um, if they're gonna do a sobriety test on you to see if you're drunk, you know, they don't have to pump your stomach to try to determine, right? They, just t- they, just, they, take a, they can do a breathalyzer or they can do, uh, to draw blood. Why is that? Because the alcohol is all over your body. It consumes you. It's, it's mixed all in. And the same thing what Paul is saying here, in the same way we are filled with the Holy Spirit, he begins to control everything about us, that we are under his influence. Instead of being under the influence of alcohol, we are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And when you look at Paul's analogy of being filled with the Spirit, uh, contrast it with being drunk with wine, there are things that we see that are very similar and some things that are dissimilar. I want us to, to quickly go through this. Uh, the, the first thing I want to talk about is, is what, 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 as we look at this analogy of being filled with the Spirit and being drunk with alcohol or drunk with wine, in what ways are the two things similar? We think about alcohol. I mentioned it earlier that alcohol captivates, it controls your body. It affects your thinking. It controls your responses. And in the same way, when someone is filled with the Holy Spirit, they find Him, they find the Spirit of God controlling both their thinking and also their responses. We, we think about being filled with the Spirit, how it impacts how we live our daily lives. We look at, at what we were like before Christ, before the Holy Spirit came and took up residence in our life. The things that used to not bother us, now bother us. Right? I mean, the words that sometimes we used to just flow like this, now we hear I mean, some, of us, some part of us, it sort of, we sort of quench a little bit. It bothers us, some of the things that are said. Somebody starts telling a dirty joke, whereas used to, we'd participate, maybe tell our own. Now all of a sudden we find ourselves trying to move away from that. Also, when you're, the Holy Spirit begins to control our lives, our priorities begin to change. Whereas used to, we may have been more worried about our buddies and our friends and hanging out. Well, now we're concerned about our wife and our children. We're worried about the things of God, and so our priorities begin to change. Also, when, the, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, how you look at people and how you look at circumstances is different than it was before Christ. Some of those folks that used to get on your nerves and you would have probably wanted to jump on and fight them, now God, they still get on your nerves, but God gives you a heart for them and you love them and you pray for them and you ask God to help you uh, deal with them, right? Surely y'all have some folks like that in your life, right? Hopefully it's not your spouse, but uh, that's for another day, another topic. Uh, the circumstances of life are different. We go through difficult times and where in the past we'd have been tempted to give up but now because the Holy Spirit dwells in us he gives us a hope and he gives us a sense of certainty that God is still at work that he is sovereign even when things look all out of control we look at what happened last Sunday last Sunday morning and you know we think about before Christ how do we deal with that how do you deal with that kind of a situation if you were in that situation where all of a sudden eight of your family members are no longer alive not because of a car wreck, but because of some evil person who comes and does a, a terrible deed. Um, you know, how do we deal with that? As Christians, we have a different perspective, right? Because we recognize and realize this place is not our home. Would our hearts be broken? My heart is broken, and I don't even know anybody there. I can't imagine if that was my child, if that was my 14-year-old daughter, what I would feel like, or in my case, if it was my 23-year-old daughter that would have been here and that would have happened I don't know how I would struggle with that, but I know that the Holy Spirit living in me would give me the strength and the courage to continue to move on, that I would begin to look at things a little different. But also your passions begin to change. The things that you're passionate about change. You become passionate about the things of God as the Holy Spirit has control of us. He begins to control those things. Another way that it simmers is that alcohol also removes all of our inhibitions. Why is it a lot of people like to drink? 
because normally they're a nerd and they wouldn't say anything and they get a little alcohol flowing through them and they, man, they can hit on the prettiest chick in the whole place, right? The prettiest girl in the whole place. They don't mind going up and talking to her. The big guy that they normally would avoid, all of a sudden they think they want to jump on him, right? Hopefully you don't have a lot of personal experience in that. Um, anyway, so alcohol removes your inhibitions. There, there's a boldness that, was, that wasn't there before. In the same way, the Holy Spirit removes our inhibitions oftentimes as well, especially as we're walking with him and as he is filling us with his spirit. You know, just a quick illustration is in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John are standing before the religious leaders, and they don't back up at all. I mean, there's no backup in their lives. They don't say, oh, we're sorry, religious leaders. We're so sorry that, you know, we offended you. No, they speak with boldness. And the religious leaders are blown away, and the Bible says they are literally they are astonished with their boldness. They're amazed at how bold these guys are. They're like, man, if you've got to kill me, kill me. To be dead is good. To live is good too. Either way, God's in control. We think about this idea of, of, of being filled with the Spirit and having the boldness to move in His power. Can you imagine what would happen in East Texas if everyone in this place left filled with the Holy Spirit, enjoying His presence, full of His Word and confident in His plan? Can you imagine the impact that we would see and Lufkin and Angelina County and even throughout this whole region, maybe even our whole world, if all of us were just consumed with the Spirit and allowing Him to control us. But also we see some ways that it's dissimilar as well. You know, alcohol, someone who is drunk, uh, they, they begin to sometimes, well, let me just be blunt, they lose their mind. I mean, they just do some crazy things, right? All right. Yeah. I mean, they will say and do some things you're going... What were you thinking? And then you realize they weren't thinking. The alcohol was thinking for them. The, the Bible is different in that. When the Holy Spirit takes over us, we are not living a reckless lifestyle, as, as Paul talked about in Ephesians 5, 18, or 18, where he talked about to be drunk with wine is debauchery or reckless living. But instead, the Holy Spirit, as he controls us, he gives us his mind, and we begin to think his thoughts, and we begin to think clearer. I, I bring this point up because... There's a movement. I, they, I read somewhere this week that it's sort of it's come again, you know, it's come back around. But I remember when I was in seminary back in the 90s um, that it was, this, this deal was going. And you can go all the way back to the Second Great Awakening. Uh, you can read the writings of Jonathan Edwards and some of those men who were the great movers and shakers. And you see the same kind of thing going on there. It may have been different terms, but the same kind of mindset. And that is that they have this idea that, and there's a saying that sort of goes that they're using today, was that we need to get drunk on Jesus. Um, and what they mean by that is they get filled with the Holy Ghost, really I think in a way that's contrary to what Scripture says, and they begin to stagger around the church like a drunk. They begin to bark like dogs and cluck like chickens. Uh, back in the Second Great Awakening, they would begin to, they would begin to roar like lions. Um, sometimes they begin to laugh hysterically. They can't control their laughter. They just begin to laugh <laughs> you know, real loud and out of control. Just a, just a side note, that's, that's not of the Holy Spirit. That, that is a false narrative. If you go back and you read, the, you read the writings around the Second Great Awakening in particular, God was moving across America in the few states that, that there were, and there was a great movement of God's Spirit, and people's lives were being changed, radically changed. And then we begin to see this false narrative come in where people begin to do these kind of things, and the focus went off of, of Jesus and began to go on the experience. People got caught up in the experience and having this emotional response. And I don't think that's what Scripture teaches at all. Really, being filled with the Spirit is not about being all worked up. Being filled with the Spirit is walking in fellowship with the Spirit of God. That's what it means. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But that is really the focal point. And so, but in contrast to this getting drunk on Jesus instead what the Bible tells us in particular in Ephesians chapter 5 is that we are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit and when that happens we begin to pay careful attention to how we live because we begin to understand the days in which we live are evil and the same thing would go if I mean what if what if y'all were all running around laughing uncontrollably roaring like lions barking like dogs clucking like chickens and a lost person walked in what would they think and you probably would be nuts and they would probably write in their assessment, I shouldn't have said that. That's making a judgment call on some folks. If I offended you, please forgive me. Um, we don't have a safe place. Hopefully this is a safe place, but I shouldn't have said that either. All right. Also, 
Also, alcohol deadens you to reality. Sometimes people get drunk or they drink because it dulls the pain. Um, I, I read something this week, and I don't even remember. It was, some, it was somebody famous and um, had, had, had admitted themselves into alcohol rehab because they had been drinking. It was, actually, it was a pastor that um, had got to the point where he was, I mean, he was pastor of a, a several thousand member church, had like nine different campuses, and he had an alcohol problem. And he got where he was even showing up to preach, and he was drunk. And so the church had to fire him, and he, began, he went into in-house treatment, and through that process, um, the counselor realized that as a six-year-old child, he had been molested. And through all those years, he'd been covering that up. With even, you know, when he got old enough to be able to get drink, he began to cover those feelings and struggles with alcohol. Alcohol dulls the pain for a moment, but the problem is, is that when you come off the alcohol, it's even worse. And so then it becomes a cycle that drives and drives. But the Bible doesn't, being filled with the Spirit is not to dull our pain, but instead the Spirit of God wants to make us alive so that we can be overcomers over those pains and those struggles. To understand that all things work together for good to those who love God. Not that God has caused those things, but God can use those hard struggles in our lives. And God can use those things for His glory and to advance His causes. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says that we go through difficult times and there are times that we suffer so that we can minister to others who are also suffering. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and verse 18, Paul says, Be careful, pay careful attention how then to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. Listen, the Holy Spirit doesn't want to numb you to reality, but He wants to expand your perception or to expand your ability to see really what's going on. In this text in Ephesians chapter 5, he warns us to pay careful attention to how we live because the days in which we live are evil. He tells us to be wise and not to be foolish. He tells us to understand God's will. And instead of numbing our pain, he wants to lift us beyond our pain or lift us through our pain. Sometimes God delivers us from the pain and sometimes he walks with us as we go through the pains. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that God's going to come in and snatch you up out of the hard, difficult times. But what he does promise is that he will be there with us. He says in, in Psalms 23, this, the psalmist said that the Lord would be with us as we're laying in the meadows enjoying the beautiful day of the spring or whether we're walking the valley of the shadow of death, that he will always be there with us, that he will never leave us. And so it's the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and filling us and empowering us that helps us to walk through the difficult struggles of life. The, the second question I want us to deal with this morning is when are we filled with the Spirit? And I, I want to begin by saying there are there are two distinct workings of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And sometimes these two things get blurred. Um, part of it's because there's places that similar terminology is used, especially in the English translation, and so sometimes it confuses things. But one is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the other is the filling of the Holy Spirit. And I want to briefly uh, hit these two concepts, these two ideas that Scripture teaches that there's an aspect that we are baptized into the Holy Spirit and also that we are filled with the Spirit. The, the first thing I want us to talk about is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit has been defined as the unrepeated work of the Holy Spirit at regeneration or at salvation, whereby we are placed into the body of Christ. We don't really talk about it a whole lot normally, but really baptism is a, somewhat of a picture of that. That when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we are regenerated, when God takes out our cold, hard, dead heart out and gives us a heart of flesh that's beating for Him, God makes us new. The Holy Spirit, we are baptized into the Holy Spirit, and we become a part of God's universal body, the church. And, it, and the Holy Spirit is to be that source of unity. I think about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. He says, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. That we have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. We are baptized into the body of Christ. It's not talking about water baptism here. It's talking about spirit baptism, that we are baptized into him. To me, it's the most awesome concept to ever think about. That not only does the Holy Spirit come to live in me when I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior, but also he engulfs me, he surrounds me. When you go into the water, the water covers every part of you, right? That the Holy Spirit consumes both us outward and inward. He is everywhere around us. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, In Him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. 
at the moment of salvation, God seals us or he stamps us as his possession, that we belong to him. We are now his children. We become the sons of God. I struggle sometimes saying that because it also applies to women as well, but there's a part of the analogy there, again, of looking back at the Old Testament, there was something special about being that firstborn son. Just think about this, that we all get that kind of uh, relationship with God, that we are the favorite. Isn't that a great concept? To know that you're not the middle child. It's always good to be the oldest child, to be number one. It's always good. Right, Wendy? It's good to be number one. Anyway, we'll move on. But God seals us or stamps us as his, position, as his possession. And in verse 14, we're also told that the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. Think about that. We think about losing our salvation, all those kind of things. And here, Paul says that the Holy Spirit not only stamps and seals us as God's, that we belong to Him, but also He is the down payment of the inheritance that, that will one day be ours, that we are citizens of the kingdom of God, that we are children of God Himself. And all the other promises that are made throughout Scripture, all of those promises come to us. We see that throughout Scripture. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. This is what Paul says to the church in Rome, Rome, in Rome, in the book of Romans, is that if you don't have the Spirit, then you are not saved, right? And if you are saved, then you have the Spirit. And you can't have part of the Spirit, you have all the Spirit, that's the reason why there's really no need for this the second blessing. And I think sometimes it's a misunderstanding. There's not some second feeling of the Holy Spirit where we're given the gift of tongues, which is proof that we really belong to God. And that was one of the areas that I was trying not to chase after, and I'm going to still not do that. But um, do I believe that tongues is a spiritual gift? I do believe that tongues is a spiritual gift. Is it often misused in the life of the church? I think oftentimes it is not in Baptist churches because we don't do it. We're on the other extreme. We don't practice it all unless we do it in our prayer closet. But in a public setting, it really should be not done unless there's an interpreter, right? And then if it is spoken, there only should be two or three people speaking in tongues at, and not at one time, but in a service, that we're to do everything in order so that there's not confusion. If somebody comes in from the outside and be confused about what Scripture teaches and think, man, that's a bunch of nuts. Um, and so there's a lot of things that that if we're going to do it, then it needs to be done scripturally. Most of the folks that I know personally practice it in their personal prayer closet. Um, I have not been given the gift of tongues. Um, as a young man, I probably sought after it a little bit. Uh, Jordan, I've talked about that a little bit. Um, I look back now, and I think that was very foolish because the Holy Spirit gives gifts as he wills, not as I will. And um, I can't pursue after any other gifts, so I shouldn't pursue after that one. If God wants me to have it, then he will give it to me. Um, and so there's not a second blessing, but the, the first working is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it happens at the moment of salvation. And at the moment of salvation, we receive all of him. He, everything that he is comes in us. We can't have half the Holy Spirit. We either have all of him or we have none of him. So the moment of salvation, we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. He comes and takes up residence in our life. The, the second working of the Holy Spirit is the filling of the Holy Spirit. And again, going back to Ephesians 5.18, and don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. We, we can see a, a, lot of, a lot about the timing of the, of, the, of the feeling when we look at the word that's translated to be filled. And I'm, I want to quickly go through this. And, and um, if you hear me speak, you know I'm not an um, English major in college. Uh, I did have two years of Greek, but I'm not a Greek scholar either. Um, but I can read. And so this verb that's translated to be filled, first of all, it is a command. It's not a suggestion. It doesn't mean if you feel like it, if you want to, to be filled. But instead, it's a command that we as Christians, that we aren't free to ignore it, but instead we are to be filled with the Spirit. It also is in the plural. It is a plural command, which means that it's not spoken just to an individual to be filled with the Spirit, but it's talking about the church as a whole, that we as the church are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we know it, it works itself out on an individual basis, but it's really a command for the whole church, not part of us, but all of us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Also, it's a passive command in that it literally means to let the Spirit fill you. It's a passive in that it's not something that you are doing. It's something the Holy Spirit is doing in you. 
It's, it's not something that we can work up in ourselves. We can't take classes on how to learn how to speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit fills us. I don't mind any sort of tongues there at all because, anyway, that's another issue. That's part of the giftedness. Uh, it's a passive command, and it's the Holy Spirit who does the work. It, it doesn't mean that we don't have our part, because we'll see in a moment, we do have a part in it, but it's the Holy Spirit who's working in and through us to fill us with His Spirit, to we are literally the word to be filled. It carries the idea of overflowing with His Spirit, that we are to be overflowing with the Spirit, so His Spirit is flowing out onto others. But also it is a present tense verb as well in this command. It is an ongoing command, and that is it is to be repeated over and over throughout our lives. Listen, there is one baptism, but there are many fillings of the Holy Spirit. The third thing, how are we filled with the Holy Spirit? There's no ritual or formula to being filled with the Holy Spirit. But there are some things that we can do and don't do that affects our walk, our relationship with the Spirit, or our ability to walk in the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit. Matter of fact, I sort of think the, the word to be filled with the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit, I think, go together. I don't think you have one without the other. But as we think about our actions and how it impacts being filled with the Holy Spirit, the first command we're given in Scripture is that we're not to stifle or we're not to quench the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, it says, don't stifle the, whole, the Spirit. Uh, most translations that I grew up with says to quench, which basically it's the same word. We, are, we, we, and how, we think about, well, how do I quench the Spirit or how do I stifle the Spirit? We go back and we look at what Scripture says. We stifle or quench the Spirit when we refuse to obey Him, or we do things that we know are contrary to His will. In other words, the Holy Spirit tells us to do something, and we say no, we are quenching, we are stifling, or we are quenching the Holy Spirit. And when God tells us to do something, we say no, we are quenching the Spirit. Whenever we know that, that, uh, that something God doesn't want us to do, and we ignore it, and we go ahead and do our own thing, in the same way, we are quenching the Holy Spirit, we are stopping His work in our life. But also we're told that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 4 verse 30, it says, And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. He says, You were sealed by Him for the day of redemption. The word translated grieve means to cause pain or to cause sorrow. And what happens is how, how we grieve the Holy Spirit is whenever we live inconsistent in our walk with Him. When we don't take our, our time with Him seriously and we sort of coast, and we think, you know, I'll make that at some other time. Listen, what happens is when we, whenever we are sporadic in our attendance in church, and I don't mean there are times that we're out of town. There's things that go on. There's times that we have an ox in a ditch. There's things we got to take care of. I don't mean, I'm not saying you got to be here every time the door is open, but I'm saying that whenever we just sort of blow it off and say, nah, it's not a big deal. I think I'll just stay home today and sleep in. Whenever we, we, we neglect prayer, we neglect um, being in the Word, we ne neglect coming together as a body of Christ, all of those things when we're inconsistent in our walk with Him, then it begins to grieve the Holy Spirit. He's sorrowful. It'd be the same way if, if I, in my home I began to ignore my wife. I would grieve her spirit and then it'd be bad for me, right? Y'all never go through that? We grieve the Holy Spirit by being inconsistent in our walk with Him, not being consistent, but also we... We impact being filled with the Spirit by walking by the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 16, and this is a powerful passage, but uh, Paul says to the church in Galatia, he says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. And so we, when we are walking in fellowship with the Spirit, I think it's the same analogy that Jesus used in the Gospel of John when he says that we are ab to abide with Christ, that we are to fellowship with Him, we are to live with Him, we are to commune with Him. He says that when we do that, then the Holy Spirit has the freedom to work and to move in our lives as, as He wills. We think about walking by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit when we do the will of God rather than the desires of the flesh. We walk in the Spirit when we do the will of God rather than the desires of the flesh. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Paul gives a long list of the sins of the flesh. He says sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, Jealousies, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. In other words, Paul says, any of the things that I forgot, those will go on here too. Anything that's similar. He says that we are to avoid those things. And then in verses 22 and 23 of Galatians 5, Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit. And these are the fruits that are produced in us as we are walking with the Spirit. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We can tell a lot about our relationship and how, 
how connected we are with Christ and how we are walking with him and whether we are filled with the Spirit or not is if are we producing these fruits? Because the Holy Spirit has the freedom to work and move in our lives, what we'll see is we'll begin to see the love of God being flowed through us. We'll see his joy, his peace, his patience, his kindness, his goodness, his faithfulness, his gentleness, and his self-control. All of those fruits in some way or another will begin to be uh, exhibited in our life. They'll begin to flow through us. When others see us, they will begin to identify the Father. Also, we do it when we live under the Spirit's influence and follow his directions, which requires that we crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Again, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul talks about that we are to crucify the flesh. We are to put the flesh to death so that we might follow after God. And also, we are to keep in step with the Spirit. We, we are to keep in step with the Spirit. We do this by obeying the word of God and walking in faith and not by sight. And the results of being filled with the Spirit is that we begin to be bold in our witness. We're joyful in our hearts. We walk in unity with other believers. We're motivated to praise the Lord and we experience spiritual growth. All of those things are outcroppings of the Spirit having control of our lives. And so we think about the two differences between being baptized with the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being baptized with the Holy Spirit really is about the Holy Spirit being in me, right? The Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in me. Being filled with the Spirit is when I begin to open up my life and allow Him to have control of every aspect of my life. When I have some areas of my life, maybe it's a pet sin that I don't want to give up, or there's an attitude that I don't want to give up, and those things that I'm saying, God, you can have everything but this. Well, let's back it up even. God calls one of our children to the mission field. And we go, Lord, that ain't happening. My kid ain't moving to Africa. That wasn't very good English either, was it? My kid is not moving to Africa, Lord. Um, when we do that, we begin to quench the Spirit of God moving and working our lives, right? That our child becomes the God of our life. Because what happens, we begin to, to let go of our life. When it, it impacts our checkbooks, our calendar. When we, any of those things that we hang on to, which in and of themselves may not be bad, but we hang on to those things and say, God, this is mine. You can have everything else, but you can't have this. Whenever, as long as we're doing that, then the Holy Spirit is really not filling us. He lives in us, but we're not giving him control. So being filled with the Spirit is being controlled by the Spirit, just like someone who is drunk is controlled by alcohol. They're not speaking of their own thoughts. They're speaking the thoughts of the alcohol that's consuming their life. And so being filled with the Spirit is allowing the Spirit of God to have control of us. And again, it's just our, our main part of it is really letting go and just walking in faith with Him, obeying His Word and walking by faith and not by sight. As we begin to do that, then God's Spirit begins to fill us, overflowing. And then you see the fruits of the Spirit being flowed out of us. And then you see God using our own spiritual giftedness to have impact, not just in the church, but also in the world around us. That's what happened as we begin to let go and say, Lord, you have control. This, this, I belong to you. Whether I live or whether I die, I'm yours. Whenever we really begin to do that, then the Holy Spirit has control of us. But if we're all honest, we struggle with that, don't we? I do. I mean, I'll be running late one morning and, you know, I'll think, well, I, you know, I'm going I'm to study my sermon scripture for my quiet time this morning. That's not a quiet time, is it? Is that really my personal time with the Lord? Of course, the fun time right now is I'm in the book of Hebrews, and I don't know how you, I don't know how you casually read through the book of Hebrews. Um, if you don't understand, go back and go read to Hebrews 6 this afternoon. That'll stretch your brain a little bit. And so we struggle with it. And so that's the reason why it's an ongoing, continual process that we need to be continually being filled with the Spirit as we confess our known sin to Him, as we begin to allow Him to move in to change us and to transform us in the image of His Son, then He begins to fill us and overpower us and move in our lives. And that's really what it's all about. And so the key to the Spirit-filled life really is an intimate relationship with Christ, obeying Him and trusting Him. It really comes down to those two things. Are we going to spend time with him? Are we going to be intimate with him? Or are we going to allow him to really control our lives? Are we just going to read things in the scripture at the surface so they don't really impact and change how we think and how we live? As we come to the end this morning, and I hope you don't close your hearts and minds, but I want you to think about a couple of things. First of all, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Does the Holy Spirit live in you? Do you know for certain the Holy Spirit lives in you? Because again, if he doesn't live in you, then you're not a Christian according to what the Bible says. Do you have a relationship with Christ? Has there come a time in your life where you understood you were a sinner, no matter how hard you worked, no matter how hard you plotted and planned, you could never earn your way back to God. 
you understood you were a sinner and you couldn't, you couldn't save yourself. And yet you also believe that Jesus Christ is who he says that he is, that he is the Son of God who came, lived a perfect life, died on a cross, bore your sins, bore my sins, paid the penalty for our sins, died, was buried, rose again so that we too could have victory over death and the grave and over our sin if we would simply receive that free gift into our life. Have you ever done that? If you've not done that, then today is the day of salvation because today could be the day of judgment. And so today is that day where you have an opportunity to respond. But what about those of us who are believers? How committed are we to walking in obedience to the Holy Spirit? How committed are we to walking in obedience to the Holy Spirit? Is it a priority in our life or is it just something that sort of tacks on? Second, are you dealing with known sin in your life or are you just excusing it, covering it up, making excuses for it? You can't walk in the Spirit and not deal with your sin because your sin quenches the Holy Spirit. It grieves the Holy Spirit. Are you dealing with any known sin in your life? And then finally, where is your dependency? What, what are you dependent upon? Is it God? Is it your spouse? Is it your family? Is it your own abilities to work things out, your own ingenuity? Is it your bank account? Is it your friends? Is it your credit cards? Where is your trust? What are you dependent upon? Because again, the work of the Holy Spirit is a passive command in that we must allow Him to work in our lives. And that means we have to be dependent upon Him. We have to be willing to let go. It's sort of like doing a trust fall. In a previous pastor, one time during a children's talk thing, I did a trust fall off the stage. That's probably one of the scariest things I've ever done. I kept thinking, did I make any of these kids mad? I could just see them going and me falling on the ground behind them. But that's really what it's all about. It? It's really us letting go and being dependent upon him, saying, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to take this step. And if I fall, I'm going to fall living for you. And if you catch me and you uphold me, then I'm going to keep living for you. Either way, God, I'm not going to give in. I'm going to trust you completely. And that's really what it means to be filled with the Spirit is to walk in His power and to walk in His anointing. It's really not about getting all worked up in an experience. Because you know what happens when we get all worked up? We all come back down, don't we? Man, we get all fired up and excited. We're going to take on the world. And then tomorrow we go back doing the same things we've always done. Being the filled with the Spirit is not about an experience. It's not, it's, it's not about an emotional experience. It's about a, an inward experience where God begins to change us to make us look more and more like Christ. And so where are you in that process? Let's pray together.